Coming up on This Week in Computer Hardware, we talk more about DirectX 12. We do frame rating on Battlefield 4 with Mantle. We have a $700 4K monitor, and we tell you how to build a $550 gaming PC. It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 261, recorded on April 3rd, 2014. Your $500 gaming PC is here. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Computer Hardware. I am your host, Ryan Shrout. Patrick is out today. He's on spring break, I guess, uh, with his kids, so more power to him. Replacing him today, or at least filling in for this week, is Josh Walworth. Josh, thanks for joining us this evening. Hey, thanks for having us. I, I heard you had uh, way too much hair on the uh, the show without me and Patrick. Yeah, well, we, yeah, right. So Patrick usually balances it out. So this week, yeah. you know, if I'd have brought Scott on, like who, who filled in for me the last couple of weeks, I've been way, way, way too, too much, much hair. Yeah. One episode of this show. So I, I thank you for, you know, shaving your head this evening and, and filling in. Taking one for the team. Um, so we got we've got a, a handful of news stories we want to get to and, and topics coming up. Uh, I, I do want to say that everything that I have seen, we haven't seen a whole lot of new releases in the last few weeks. I guess news from GDC. We talked about DirectX 12 last week. We'll talk a little bit more about it today. Uh, April and May look to be incredibly busy for both motherboards, graphics cards, processors. Surprisingly so. Um, so if you somehow think we are in a lull of PC hardware. Just wait a little bit, and it will it will fix itself. Speaking so of, you, you considered the last several months a lull. Um, I I guess maybe I mean, not. not a huge new. I mean, not nothing massive, but there haven't been like yeah, huge new product releases, right? So, um, you know, the two nine. What do we have? If we had the two ninety X and the two ninety, and then you had like. I don't know if you consider the 280s, the 270s, like the rebrands of all of those cards, really big news. You had Mantle release in February. Um, Very. That was kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah. It, okay, you're right. It hasn't, it hasn't, we don't have any new flagship parts yet, but I think some of that might change soon as well. Maxwell. Um, Talked a little yeah. bit about Maxwell, yeah. We oh, did, well. we did do that. Yeah, another, yeah, yeah another. you go on. Mainstream release, but no, but this is what, what's interesting about that is um, for those of us in the community that really, and I think there's a, a strong uh, allotment of these people that really focus on the budget side of it, the absolute most performance per dollar. Um, <clears throat> Ken actually posted up a story at, on PCPer.com today that looks at building a gaming PC focused at the 1080p resolution for about $550. Um, I think the, we did this a little bit when the new consoles were released, when the PS4 and Xbox One were released. We kind of said, here's what you can do. I actually think we have better performing parts for a lower amount of money. I think our price last time was in the $700 range, Josh. We worked on that that piece together yeah, as well. Yeah, but that had like a, a, a hex core or six core yeah. or whatever you yeah. call it. And yeah, a little bit higher it, end stuff. It was, it was interesting because uh, some of the feedback we got from that uh, in typical internet fashion was uh, people calling us idiots for choosing the wrong parts. Um, yeah. <laughs> this is this is the internet after all. So uh, we kind of went back and, and after we got past the, uh, uh, you know, the bad grammar and the poorly worded insults, we, we actually looked at what parts they were looking at and what parts some of these communities, you know, in particular, if you look at uh, the, the build a PC subreddit is a great place to go um, find people that know how to get every ounce of performance out of their dollar for building PCs and for gaming PCs in particular. Uh, and we kind of decided to buy a couple of these configurations that people were using and actually test them, right? Because a lot of these, well, these particular platforms are not anything that we had, ever, I had ever used before. We typically stay in the mainstream to high end parts, right? So uh, for example, <clears throat> on the AMD side, we have the <clears throat> excuse me, the X4760K processor, which is an Athlon branded part. Uh, it's a quad core part. Um, 
I think this is Richland based on the on the processor side, Josh. Do you know yeah, for sure? Yeah, it's, it's Richland, and uh, it has the graphics uh, portion disabled. Yeah, uh, and it's an eighty-five dollar processor, right? Uh, and then we coupled that with a gigabyte uh, F two A fifty five M motherboard that is a sixty dollar motherboard. Um, and then on the other side, we have an Intel Pentium G3220, a Pentium branded processor, but it's actually Haswell architecture. It's a $65 processor, so even $20 less than the Athlon X4. Uh, it's two cores, two threads, so it's dual core but no hyper threading. Um, and it also has a $60 motherboard attached to it, an Asus H81ME. Now, the difference between these two motherboards is interesting. The H81 is actually a significantly newer chipset. It has support for SATA 6, uh, SATA 6G. Uh, storage technology and USB 3 that the AMD board did not. If you look at the common components between both of those platforms, we went with an MSI R9 270 graphics card, which you can get for $180, which is like at the MSRP, which is amazing for AMD cards. Um, eight gigs of memory, a single DIMM is actually less expensive. Uh, and CPU performance testing showed only like a three to four, maybe 5% performance deficit for using single channel. This lets you have a cheaper path for upgrading in the future. Uh, one terabyte caviar green, a 450 watt power supply from Cooler Master, a Cooler Master N200 micro ATX case for 50 bucks. And your total is 560 or $540, depending on which of these platforms you go with. Um, 560 bucks for the AMD system is actually a little bit more expensive than the Intel. If you look at the performance, right, the actual gaming performance, uh, we looked at Battlefield 4, we looked at Metro Last Light and Grid 2 at 1080p at their maximum image quality settings. And the difference between these two cards, or these two systems rather, is negligible. You know, the Intel is maybe one, maybe two frames per second faster in your average frame rate, but you'd be hard pressed to ever be able to tell the difference between those two, those two levels of performance. If you look at the CPU side, um, it's a it's an interesting story, right? Because the AMD processor is a quad core, which means it's going to be more productive in heavily multi-threaded applications like uh, Handbrake. We don't have it here, but it's actually a better performer in Handbrake. It's a better performer in the second pass of X264 benchmark, which is the more multi-threaded portion of that. Uh, it's more it's more powerful when you look at like the Cinebench 11 result in the multi-threaded section there. But in single-threaded workloads, as in the single-threaded version of Cinebench or the, the first pass of the X264 benchmark, the Intel processor is faster. It's the Haswell architecture. It's, uh, it just has you know, better IPC than what Richland has for sure, even though this AMD processor is running at 3.8 gigahertz and the uh, Intel processor is running at 3 gigahertz. So... Depending on, you know, if you do a lot of video transcoding, the quad-core processor is going to help you out, going to be maybe 20% faster than what Intel has. Uh, but I think for gaming purposes, you know, the single and dual-threaded performance of the Intel Pentium part is going to give you a little bit of an edge there, but it's going to be pretty pretty damn close, I think. Um, I don't know, like, this, this to me was just kind of an impressive experiment for us. Like I said, I did, we actually bought the X4 processor, bet the, bought the Pentium processor and these motherboards because I was like, all these people are saying they're using these parts. Are they just sacrificing performance in other areas? Are they just willing to do that? Um, and, you know, Ken Ken did a lot of the work and the, you know, the testing and the analysis of, of the hardware itself. And there are a lot of instances where not in game, but doing other tasks, you could just tell the difference. If you're used to using a quad core Haswell part or an Ivy bridge part, uh, and you suddenly step down to a dual core Pentium, and you're opening up multiple applications, you're running Steam and, and Origin at the same time, and they're downloading stuff, or you're transferring files over the network, there are slowdowns that occur. Um, but when you actually close all that stuff out and just focus on the gaming part of it, they actually do, they do pretty well. And, you know, the most expensive part in this build is clearly the graphics card at $180. Uh, I think it's more than twice as much as the next most expensive part, right? So, um, you know, if you're building a budget gaming PC, that seems to make sense. What did you make of these kind of results and these two different uh, parts, Josh? Well, it's it's interesting to see the results, obviously, because uh, a lot of people game at 1080p. I mean, that's the average size of a single monitor anymore. And so, uh, you know, it's easy to see that, that CPU performance, I mean, it does mean a bit here and there in gaming. Yeah. Uh, but overall, yeah, you're always better off to buy a more expensive graphics card. Um, 
And so it's, yeah, I, I the one thing that, that kind of bugs me about the AMD part is it comes with that A55 chipset. And there's absolutely no reason why not it doesn't support USB 3.0 and SATA 6G because those are actually native to that chip, but they just disable them for, Ooh. you know, kind of part binning and, and um, you know, the places where they're at. And so, uh, yeah, it would be, uh, I'd be kind of hard pressed to uh, go for a, uh, you know, the AMD quad core over yeah. that Pentium or just spend a little bit more on uh, the Intel side and get, you know, some significantly better performance in a, you know, either, either a uh, dual core hyper threaded or true quad core. It's one of the things when you get into buying components at these price levels, 15, $16 motherboards, a sale or a rebate makes a significant percentage difference uh, in the overall decision, right? So uh, it's entirely possible that you would find an A75 motherboard next week that's going to be the same price, maybe $5 less expensive, that will have some of those features enabled. And if so, you know, obviously move up to that to that price point. Um, you know, we're just kind of basing this on what can we find on Amazon that day while we are building the system, while we are, you know, buying parts. Um, and that's why, you know, the $20 difference between the AMD and the Intel configuration, uh, that could be $5 tomorrow. It could be $5 in favor of the AMD system tomorrow, or it could increase the other way, right? So when you get into $10 and $20 differences um, between individual components or even for the whole system here being a deciding factor, it's uh, it, it, can, it can mean a lot to some people that are on that tight budget, but I think it makes sense to stretch a little bit more to get those things like SATA 6 uh, or SATA 6G and USB 3 support on there if you can. But uh, I well, thought it was an interesting ask experiment. You this. One yeah. other thing. Um, did he ever test Mantle on this? Um, uh, we did not, right? We did three different games, Battlefield 4 on it. Uh, you know, it'd be, it'd be interesting to see because the... Intel processor is still a low-performing part as well. I would think we would see fairly similar gains between a quad-core AMD and the dual-core Intel, wouldn't you? I Yeah, I would expect so. Maybe AMD at this point would have a small advantage just because it does support more threads. And, uh, you know, Mantle will uh, more adequately kind of address a multi-threaded processor more than just two threads is what Intel right. offers. So that would be an interesting experiment. And yeah. I don't know, maybe, maybe flog Ken a little bit this weekend. Uh. <laughs> While I'm gone, having yep. fun at the final four, get in here and test mantle on this $500 computer. I like it. I like the way you think. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, <laughs> I have two small children, you know, yeah, go rake that yeah, lawn you, while I go drink this beer. You, you've learned yeah. the process. I like that. It's good. Yeah. Um, Allen posted a review as well this week looking at the A-Data Premier Pro SP920 SSD series. And he actually was lucky enough to get a hold of all four in the series, 128, 256, 512 gig, and the one terabyte drive to kind of run them through um, performance. This is not a new controller. It is an existing controller from Marvell. Um, it's not new memory. It's uh, basically the same controller, slightly, you know, updated um, uh, a firmware, I guess, but it does have rated performance on the one terabyte model. And that's kind of important to point out uh, at 560 megabytes per second read and 500 megabytes per second writes um, that goes down. I think at which model did that go down at Josh? I think at the, it goes down at the 512 model, but then goes down significantly again at the 128, I think is how that worked out. It's based on yeah, the how 128 many channels is, is it is. Far fewer dies. And uh, yeah. I think using about half the channels, so right okay. is bad. Yeah, if you look at the you know the PC per file copy test, the first result in the file creation, you'll see that the 128 gig model has significantly slower write speeds because of that. Read speeds are a little bit lower, but not dramatically so. Um, yeah, you can see in the table there things are kind of laid out. The sequential writes drop from. Uh, as high as 500 down to 180. So you can see it kind of kind of laid out there. And it's all about how many actual uh, NAND flash are on, you know, the actual uh, modules are on there and what, how many channels they can address and things like that. So What was the uh, original, it, it, uh, what, uh, the uh, M25 Intel 
80 gig drive that it had X25M. Like, yeah, and what yeah. was the write speeds that they kind of limited on that? It was like 80 megs. It was like 80. I think it was 80 megs yeah. a second. Yeah. Why? But anyway, so yeah, it's kind of interesting to see a, a <laughs> Intel doing that to kind of limit it so they can, you know, sell their enterprise stuff for more that has, you know, better yeah. performance as compared to these guys who they just can't fit enough dies on the PCB to get the performance of writes up there. It's interesting because that means they're using larger dies, right? If they were using yeah. smaller capacity, maybe that would work, but then it's a cost It's a cost trade-off there. Yeah, nobody's making 25 nanometer NAND anymore. It's just not cost-effective against yep. the 20 and the 19. Uh, maybe the best part about this drive is the price. Um, the MSRP of the one terabyte model is $530. 512 gig is $335. 256 gig is $160 and the 128 gig is uh, $90, which is um, that that puts it, you know, well below the pricing of, say, the 840 series from Samsung or the 730 series from Intel. And it kind of puts it, I think, maybe a little bit below or right at the uh, the Evo, uh, 840 Evo pricing. It's a little above um, because little above? the... Uh, okay. The 500 Evo, I think this is, you can get this for 255 So yeah. it's a $70 it's difference. Impressive. Yeah. The, can I shake the, that around my camera a little bit more? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The um, retail pricing is one thing, like, wh like what the expected MSRP is and what it actually ends up selling for uh, will, will be interesting. Look at it, looking at Amazon now, um, they're available on pre-order for exactly the uh msrp i'll check new egg real quick and see if they're actually available yet uh yeah at the only only the 256 and the 128 are actually available but they are at um msrp so that could come down but even even at msrp that's a pretty good price for the performance you're getting uh from this this kind of well-known well-established controller which is always a plus so check that out if you want to um you mentioned Mantle, and I did a little article on Mantle this week. Uh, thanks uh, on Battlefield 4, we tested some performance of Crossfire with Battlefield 4 using the Mantle API and comparing it to DirectX. And we compared it uh, in a way that we had not yet been able to compare it previously because uh, our, our testing methodology we call frame rating uses capture you know, it directly captures the game output from the video card, and we do some post-process analyzing on that video file to measure performance. But all that depends on a small piece of software running locally on the computer being tested uh, called an overlay that draws different colored bars on the left-hand side of that screen in a sequential order uh, in a fashion that lets us easily measure the results after the fact. With Mantle being a not DirectX or not OpenGL API, we didn't actually have the ability to run that overlay. We didn't have a piece of software to do it. Uh, and there are very few people actually know how to use Mantle yet. So the community hadn't really been, been able to build anything like that. So uh, what DICE did, and in particular, Johan Andersen, the lead developer there, technical director, I guess, is his official title at DICE. Uh, I talked to him several times over the last six, eight months about you know, the, the, the FCAT style testing, the capture testing, you know, looking for smoothness in performance as opposed to just frame rates. He totally bought into all of that and he was willing to integrate an FCAT style overlay directly into Battlefield 4, which he did, which you can, oh, you can now uh, enable through a console command perf overlay dot draw FCAT. Uh, one, and that will turn it on. And we use that to then uh, compare performance of single GPU 290X versus dual GPU 290X and see where uh, multi-GPU scaling stood with Battlefield 4 and Mantle. Um, and it was, it was, it's kind of an interesting endeavor. The results, uh, I would say, are, they're not bad, but they're not great. They're kind of mixed. Uh, on the 3960X platform, which is our our high end kind of our standard GPU test bed, um, we saw a lot of these uh, flat lines at both 1920 by 1080 and 25 by 14. These uh, places where the 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 average frame rate of what we saw on Mantle and Crossfire was like this kind of flat line across the, across the graph, right? Very, very consistent, but also very, very um, low levels of variance, right? So 
variance in multi-GPU considerations is usually bad. It means you're going to have short frames, long frame, short frame, long frame. You're going to have uh, an unsteady frame rate, which can result in kind of a less than perfect gaming experience, even if your average frame rate per second seems to be pretty good. Um, this is, you know, I think this is just a, uh, a, a, artifact of the early implementation of multi-GPU support in Mantle. You have to remember that multi-GPU implementations, when you're using the Mantle API, don't really use the driver anymore. AMD does has very little to do with the multi-GPU implementation. It's all up to the developer. It's all up to the game engine to implement a multi-GPU rendering system, right? So this is kind of the, the first experiment with it, the first crack at it by one of the best developers in the world, obviously, um, but still one of the first to really to really try it. Um, and so, you know, in particular, if you look at the 2560 by 1440 results uh, with the high-end platform, you'll see it, do, it can scale, but it does so at like a very flat level, right? And if you scroll down a couple of graphs to the one labeled frame times, you'll see that in a, in a more dramatic fashion, right? That orange line that you see go across um, would, you know, if you take the, take away the fact that it's completely flat, you know, without any kind of peaks and valleys to it, the fact that it's very thin is a great sign, right? It's very consistent frame time delivery. The fact that it's flat and it doesn't kind of change with the scene as the scene changes as the pink, black, and green lines do tells us that this is, you know, probably this is the first pass at the algorithm that they're still perfecting on how to do it. Um, further talks I've had with uh, Johan said that there's, you know, there's actually three different ways that you can uh, test enable frame pacing. They're all up in the air right now. Nothing's finalized. So when we get some more time, we may test all three of those and see how they act and how they react to different game scenes. Um, but it was an interesting kind of experiment. And it was really more meant to to showcase the fact that, hey, here's a developer that is willing to go that extra mile to uh, help enable the community to help improve the gaming experience for PC gamers everywhere, right? So there's no, there's no need for DICE to include this overlay. I'm sure AMD probably didn't want that overlay to be in there because <laughs> Mantle and Crossfire is not really a perfected thing yet, clearly. Um, but the fact that they were able to do it allows us to analyze it, set a baseline for performance today, see improvements as the weeks and months go on, uh, and hopefully this will push uh, either AMD to release a kind of universal mantle overlay or to at least have all these different game engines implement something to that effect so that we can keep track of this stuff and push uh, you know, AMD to improve things as we move forward. So, I don't know. I don't know. That's kind of the summation of everything. But I don't know if you had any other thoughts on that, Josh. Uh, you know, mantle development is interesting. Uh, you know, ever since, and we'll get into this later with the uh, the announcement of DirectX 12, uh, there were a lot of questions if developers would stick with mantle with you know an, another year and a half, year and three quarters before we actually see products. So it's nice to see uh, both Dice and AMD continue to push mantle and improve it. I mean, this patch was was a pretty big thing for for uh, mail support. So obviously, uh, support is not going away anytime soon, or at least we we hope. Yeah, yeah. But I I I thought it was an interesting thing. I didn't get to spend a whole as much time with it as I had wanted to uh, with Battlefield Four, but um, maybe next week we'll get a chance to do that. Which leads us into the next story, as you so. Uh, properly introduced us to about Microsoft talking about DirectX 12. Um, it actually happened last week at GDC. I know Patrick and uh, uh, Scott talked about it a little bit last week as well, but you posted another another editorial kind of talking about what your thoughts were on DirectX 12 uh, and then what it meant moving forward for that. What, what, did, what was kind of your takeaway from uh, what Microsoft announced, how it relates to Mantle, and uh, why it's going to be important for PC gaming in the not-too-distant future. Oh, geez. Why don't you just ask the really simple questions? Yeah, why is water you wet? you got to please think about these things. Um, you know, I wrote this article because a bunch of people had put out, you know, some, some early DirectX 12 uh, overviews that talked about what Microsoft showed in their uh, in their GDC presentation. But that stuff was pretty bland. What really became interesting is what AMD was saying about it, what NVIDIA came out and finally started to say, 
where we could kind of compare and contrast timelines of when Mantle was released, when work was started on it, as compared to when Microsoft started talking to uh, their partners about DirectX 12, uh, what features uh, it would encompass. And, you know, the tech industry is is kind of incestuous. I mean, there are a lot of people moving around to company to company. Um, Roadmaps get leaked internally, and they tell their buddy at the bar from another company kind of what's going on. And so we kind of have this strange and interesting timeline of of when DirectX 12 was talked about, when they started to finalize settings, and when they actually started to develop it with their partners to have working demos uh, by this GDC. Um, I think NVIDIA said about four years ago they started talking about it. I believe that Microsoft said something that that real development started about three years ago. Mm. Uh, AMD obviously was part of these talks with NVIDIA. Intel, uh, we've seen like Qualcomm dragged in. I could imagine that... Uh, you know, imagination technologies and others who actually design graphics parts were are are also on the DirectX you know kind of committee, and uh, you know I, I went over some theories about why Microsoft did what they did with DirectX 12, uh, obviously with DirectX 11 and all the previous DirectX iterations. One of the biggest complaints was how thick the abstraction layer was, how much that really controlled, and how much that affected performance. Because if you look at how driver development has gone along, I remember back in the day when drivers were, you know, you download a 128K driver. A one meg driver was a pretty big deal at the time. And I'm talking, this is 1996, 97. Uh, I remember some of the first 3DFX drivers that, that supported... Glide, Direct 3D uh, were maybe 1.2 megs, if even that. And so now we're looking at, you know, NVIDIA, AMD, all these other guys. I mean, their drivers for a new install, it's over 200 megs. We're approaching 300 megs. And why is that? It's because there's so much optimization per application that they have to do to get maximum performance out of i mean the 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 file size has just gotten massive um this is one thing that direct x12 will kind of address because Mm. driver side optimizations will not be as effective due to the lower level abstraction that we're going to see in at least a portion of DirectX 12. This uh, graph that they're showing here, it shows the old DirectX 11 up top. It was very, very heavily single thread dependent. And even though it could give some uh, work off to other threads, it didn't necessarily do it effectively. The driver still, you know, kind of resided on that single thread. But when we look at the bottom part, we can see what DirectX 12 does. It more adequately utilizes multiple threads and you have a huge decrease in time, uh, just CPU time, from DX11 to DX12 just because there's so much less driver and application overhead for just DirectX. Um, So it's kind of interesting to see where they're going. Now, there's a lot of debate if AMD's mantle really pushed Microsoft to change how they were going to approach DirectX. Um, It's amazing because in between your DirectX articles and mine, I mean, we've got a massive amount of comments and people getting really kind of upset. (laughs) And you wouldn't think that with DirectX. I mean, DirectX is kind of like, you know, vanilla cake. I mean, who cares? It's it's an API. But uh, people are very, very passionate about it. And they're uh, blaming, you know, AMD did this and NVIDIA is holding things back and Microsoft is doing all these interesting politics. Um, it's it's kind of an interesting situation. That, that you, I, I honestly did not expect the feedback that we have received so far. But I think, you know, my, my theory was 
that AMD was not happy with how quickly DirectX 12 was being released. Obviously, they worked extensively with Microsoft because AMD provided the uh, the chip for the Xbox One. And I think a variety of factors, namely Xbox One performance versus the PS4, um, right. the lack of uptake in uh, things like Surface and uh, Windows Phone, and uh, just kind of the stagnation in the PC world of DirectX and, you know, I mean, DirectX 11 has been out since 2009. This is one of the longest stretches ever of yeah, not having... Yeah, I don't having... count 11.1 .1 or 11.2 .2 as any kind of noteworthy yeah. release, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, uh, you know, AMD kind of helped push the industry with Mantle. And I think that uh, Microsoft uh, really looked at a bunch of different things and said, you know what, we're really behind here. Uh, you know, I think that DirectX 12 was originally, I mean, this is my gut feeling. I think that was originally set in motion to be a midlife upgrade for the Xbox One to mm. give it more selling potential in the future and uh, give it a reason, you know, give people a reason to, you know, continue buying them or, you know, change from Sony to, to Microsoft if they so desire. Um, but just the industry has not allowed that to happen. Uh, there are a lot of forces at play. Uh, I imagine that, you know, Intel, AMD... NVIDIA were all very unhappy because the performance of their hardware is being limited and constrained by the old DirectX. I mean, if you look at that graph, you know, we see how biased it is towards single thread performance. And here, I mean, the reason why Intel and AMD are selling more and more CPUs is uh, not so much faster IPC, even though Intel does have a nice grip on that but i mean yeah. they've spread it out i mean we have more cores more threads uh why would intel want to release an eight core 16 thread enthusiast uh product if you're not going to see a whole lot of difference between that and one of their you know 200 dollars four cores so it's going to be interesting to hear more about the development of dx12 and hopefully some people in the industry We'll be more willing to talk about it, but uh, you know, still, it's it's a nice jump up, it's a nice change, and uh, I'm happy to see it coming down the road. I think I think it'll be interesting. I think a lot of the drama of did AMD inspire Mantle or did did Mantle inspire DirectX um, versus did it drive it forward? Did they did Microsoft copy of it? I don't. I guess I don't really care. It doesn't really matter at the end of the day. Um, it, it more. What's more important is whose hardware is going to benefit at what point and by how much, right? And that's the stuff that we can actually measure and report on. The kind of the 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 smut scene behind behind everything is mostly not something we tend to care that much about. Show me show me what actually changes and who benefits, and uh, we'll talk about that. But interesting interesting to see how it's going to pan out. Again, they're saying not until shipping games. Holiday 2015, is that right? Yep, yep. So we've got a lot of time for all this to uh, digest, I guess. Uh, if we look at some other, maybe some more uh, upbeat news, some things that you can buy today, uh, well, you could at least, there was a 4K monitor option being sold, uh, pre-ordered on Amazon for $699. This is a 28-inch panel from Samsung, probably using the same panel that we've seen on many other 28 uh, 28 inch 4K monitors uh, in the past three or four months or so. So it's 3840 by 2160 resolution. It does it does support 60 hertz refresh rates with a DisplayPort 1.2 connection. Uh, HDMI supports up to 30. 699 is what it was going on pre order for, uh, but I believe that is sold out. Amazon is not taking more pre orders, and now the pre order sale is like. 840 something dollars which is still reasonable but i wouldn't pay more than the 699 that, that people were pre-ordering it for let it it was going to ship i think uh the beginning of next week so let that start to ship and and uh, see who else might have it for around 700 bucks but you know even though it has a tn monitor which i know you're going to talk yeah. about a tn panel yeah. i would not kick that bet that monitor out of my bed for <laughs> We, yeah, Not we talked about that on our, on our podcast last night that it's a TN panel, but it's it just acts differently than your standard yeah, TN. It's, it's not your father's TN. It's not 
your uncle. It's not, you know, hell, it's it's not Jeremy's TN monitor. No, no, and he um, hates TN monitors. He hates TN. But, uh, yeah, it, it, it uh, you know, I, I saw these at um, CES, and I went in there, I'm kind of looking at it, and I'm, I'm doing my, you know, back and forth thing, which you usually see, you, you, you will usually see color shifting with TN monitors. Right. That really wasn't readily apparent. Uh, you could you could see from angles that typically you know I mean stuff would turn purple with TN and it didn't do that. And I think that's just kind of the design and the density of pixels on you know a 28 inch monitor that they couldn't have kind of the I guess you'd call it the deep wells that polarizing effect um, that we see in usual TN monitors. So obviously they good. have they have changed the design quite a bit. Uh, because it it doesn't look bad, I wouldn't feel bad getting one of those. And six hundred and nine dollars is almost reasonable for that. If you think about um, still today, three hundred dollar super IPS. I mean, a thirty inch super IPS is still over a thousand bucks, brand new. For and 4K? that's twenty five. No, that's twenty five sixty by right. 1600. By fourteen forty or sixteen hundred. Yeah, because the yeah. the the um, the uh, IGZO 4K monitors, like the ASUS PQ321, that's still $2,500, right? This is a significant price reduction on that. Um, I I think they're going to be pretty good monitors. And I think for 700 bucks, which is about 2x the price what you would pay for uh, one of those kind of Korean branded 2560 by 1440 panels anyway, Um I think I think it makes a really compelling option. I've been I've been trying to get a hold of Samsung to get one of these in, or one of the Dells or Asus or whoever else is making one of these because <clears throat> I want to see, in like a longer term use, does the TN panel still play as nice as it did uh, when we were just looking at them for you know a handful of seconds at a time, at uh, CES in January. So. Neat stuff. So neat we'll, stuff. Yeah. Whenever you want to pre-order me one of those, that's that's fine. I'll, I, I gotta I'll send you. Graphics testing, you know. Yeah, yeah. You'll clear off room on your desk, I assume. You'll make space. Not on this desk, no. <laughs> or my wife's. Uh, a couple other things I'll note real quick. Uh, if you go to PCPro.com, Maury posted a review of a uh, all-in-one liquid cooler, which we talk about a lot. Uh, the Cooler Master Glacier 240L. And that's a big, powerful uh, water cooler. It has a much larger than normal... Um, heat block on it, uh, heat plate on it rather, and it has a pretty good sized radiator. It's a 240 millimeter rad. Uh, but the most interesting part to me is if you look at, oh, I don't know, I guess it's probably on the second page uh, under the features and cooler design. Uh, if you look at somewhere down there in the middle of the page, there's a uh, an outlet, an inlet or an outlet for you to add or remove fluid, which is kind of unique. You don't really see that, you know, on the Corsair units that I've had or the, the Antec one that you've looked at as well. Um, this system actually is meant to be expanded. So you can actually add other things into the loop with this kind of all-in-one liquid cooling system, right? So you can actually, you know, if you're Maybe you bought that Asus Poseidon GTX 780 video card and it has optional water cooling on it. You can add that into the loop with the proper equipment. You know, it has room for you to add fluid and it has room for you to expand the loop on out. It's pretty, it's pretty interesting stuff. It's uh, 130 bucks. It does relatively good in terms of just normal overclocking and CPU performance and anything that you would expect to do, it should do out of the box. Uh, but the expansion on it is really the thing I think that makes it stand out. So if you're interested in that, check out that review. It is on uh, our homepage still. And then uh, the final thing I guess I'll point out, the final little uh, article here, is a review posted uh, by Sebastian Peake on our website as well, looking at the BitPhoenix Colossus Micro ATX case. This is an interesting design. It has a very specific aesthetic to it. Uh, you either are going to like it or you don't. I like it. That white bar actually lights up uh, in different colors, red, green, blue. Um, maybe more more interesting, the, the probably the most interesting part about this is that it's, uh, I think if you go to the Building the System Part 1 page, you'll see that it actually mounts all the components upside down. So they're actually uh, mounted 
kind of in the inverse that you would say. What's the, what's another case that's done that before, Josh? Like the the Raven? BTX, BTX cases. Okay, yeah, they did do that, but that was a whole different. Do you have to have, yeah, that but was yeah, the, same the, the Raven and that uh, one from HP that you stood on. Oh same yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. The uh, I don't remember what RB, that is, but the Silverstone yeah. Raven series does this inverted thing. I know main gear systems do this as well. Um, actually, some of them actually just rotate at 90 degrees so that the heat of the graphics cards are exhausting straight up. Here, it's actually 180 degrees. It's mirrored and flipped, if you will. So the stuff, the, the hardware mounts to the other side of the case than you're used to, and the door that opens is on the other side of the case than you're used to. Uh, but everything is upside down. So uh, interesting little setup there. I highly encourage you guys, if you're interested, to, it's it's got a couple little quirks with the... Um, uh, external connections like the audio connectors and USB connectors that Sebastian pointed out. Uh, but if you are looking for a smaller case, micro ATX, this will do micro ATX and mini ITX motherboards. Uh, check that out if you will as well. Um, let's see here. Well, I guess that's pretty much it for news for this week. Uh, I think we got time for a handful of questions. If you want to email us, your question. We encourage you to do so. Uh, we've had we've been a little light in the last couple of weeks in terms of actual questions coming in. We get all kinds of spam. I don't know why, uh, because people read this email account you really like once a week, but uh, we get a lot of that. It's twitch at twit.tv, T-W-I-C-H at twit.tv. Send that in, uh, and it goes to both Patrick and I, and we'll be able to monitor it and filter out some of these questions. Um, now I went through a handful here, but I'm not 100 percent sure. Uh, I don't think we've I don't think we addressed any of these in the episodes while I was gone. I listened quickly, uh, but I think we should be clear. And I've got Josh on hand to help with all of these much more difficult questions. Um, let's see. Let's take one uh, from Daniel here. It says I'm about to put together a new system, probably based around a Xeon E3. 1230 V3. Is it worth waiting for the new Intel 9 series chipsets or are the improvements only incremental? Also, if the choice is between a GTX 770 and a Radeon R9 280X, any particular recommendations? Thanks for your help. Uh, Josh, you know anything about what features are expected in the R9 series or the new Intel 9 series chipsets? Josh? I'm still here, but I'm thinking. Thinking you know, hard? I, I don't think it's a huge jump up from the 8 series. I believe that we're still going to have about the same, if not a couple more, SATA 6G ports, USB 3. Uh, yeah. You know, it seems that most of the magic anymore happens on the CPU. And so you're focused more on that. I mean, that's got the memory controller. It's got the PCIe controller. And certainly I.O., plays a pretty important part, uh, but it's not like, you know, six or seven years ago when we had the, uh, you know, the AMD SB600 Southbridge that had absolutely hideous I.O. performance and no features and nobody liked using it because even though it supported AHCI, it actually kind of slowed things down as compared to, you know, just using the stock Microsoft driver. driver. Uh, now we're we're kind of past that. Uh, AMD and and Intel are certainly on nearly the same level in chipset uh, chipset performance and features. Intel's a little bit faster, but yeah, I mean they're not going to add a huge amount to the nine series. I think that's primarily the nine series is going to address the updated uh, Haswell refresh parts and uh, potentially Broadwell. I mean. You I obviously can't yet. say yeah. yeah, yeah, anything about it, and and I don't have all of that information. And certainly, if I was given the information, <laughs> I couldn't tell you. But uh, I think uh, we will find out some of these answers within the next couple of months, and certainly before Computex. So, yeah, uh, if you're curious, just have a little patience. Try to milk your current um, computer as much as you can. And, it won't, it won't uh, be long, that's for sure. The only thing yeah. uh, that's coming up, I, I did a quick Google for in, in Intel 9 series chipsets. The only thing that it says that it's adding are like PCIe M.2 interface and extra SATA and USB ports. So 
if that's actually the case, plus the support for additional processors, um, I wouldn't say there's a whole lot of reason to wait unless you are really looking forward to some of those new processors. But I don't, I don't think they're going to be very dramatically different either. So I don't know. I'm never one to say uh, I would wait. I don't like waiting for hardware, but that's just me. Just uh, what about quiet. the choice between a GTX 770 and the R9 280X? Which of those do you like? Uh, you know, they're both nice. Uh, the GTX 770 comes in, you know, a base platform with two gigs. You can buy now four gig uh, products if you're planning on doing, you know, higher resolutions, 2560 to 4K, as well as surround type resolutions. Um, the 280X, it comes stock with three gigs. Now you can get some products that have six gigs of memory on there for quite a bit more. Uh, it seems like uh, the mining craze has died down a little bit, and certainly either they're buying less or AMD is supplying more, but the prices are becoming a lot more competitive as compared to what they used to be because, you know, a 280X was hitting $500 when MSRP was $299. So it's nice to see those coming down. You really got to compare and contrast the, the features that you think that you will use. If you're excited about Mantle, obviously you want the 280X. Uh, if you're going to SLI these or, or you know put them in pairs, NVIDIA still has a better uh, product when it comes to multi-GPU and uh, support for that in, in software and through developers. Yeah. It's six of one, half a dozen of the other. Uh, it really is, you're going to need to look at price and uh, how much you like NVIDIA drivers versus, you know, a few more extra AMD type features like Mantle. And again, uh, 280X will not support true audio, which is a little bit of a bummer. Indeed. Uh, we got an email from Bradley who says, I'm more interested in phone processors and hardware lately. On the recent uh, All About Android show, they announced the new HTC One and didn't even list the specs. Uh, Gina said she was uh, too bored with them, not to mention them on the show, right? So a lot of people don't think there's a whole lot of variance in that market. Anyway, I would love if you could talk some more about the system on chips like the new Snapdragon 801 and 805. Love to know about some of the changes. Is the RAM faster? I'd like to know how the SOCs are different, et cetera. Uh, not a specific question here, but an interesting point from uh, Brad about, you know, who is covering these processors? Are they covered in the same way that we cover Intel and AMD processors today, NVIDIA and AMD GPUs today? Uh, and I'd say that's something that both of us uh, on the show here will admit that we don't do as much as we should. And that's probably where there's kind of a more regular iteration of innovation uh, on that side than there is maybe on the desktop side currently as well. Um, so that's something that we know about. We know that it is kind of missing from uh, our show and our websites and things like that. So we, I think we plan on addressing that, right? We're, we're, we're diving well, we're, more into that. We've got all the meetings in and you know, we're learning about it as we go as well. Yes, and part of that is not so much learning. I mean, we, we know already a lot about it. Uh, we know the basic architectures. We know where ARM is going. We know where they've been. We know that the massive yeah. jumps that we have seen in the past three years have really been impressive um but the problem is intel sends you a cpu you can compare it against amd cpu in a nearly identical configuration with power supply memory video card hard drives and to compare these products you need well i've got this galaxy s whatever and i can compare it against this apple whatever but how do you adequately do that in terms of performance? Uh, you can do some things and features because, yeah, hardware supports this, but the software doesn't support that. Mm. But in the yeah. other one, it's got a lower feature set, but the software actually supports more things. It's just, it's kind of impossible because you've got cell phones, you've got tablets, you've got all these huge range of TDPs, performance and specs that, they don't even tell you everything about. And so it's it's very hard to kind of quantize and get a good feel about uh, because every individual cell phone out there, they're going to adjust its performance 
to the battery that they've been had installed. Uh, they may have a different speed of uh, LDDR3 yeah. as compared to another phone. I mean, it's just it it you can pull your hair out all day long, which obviously I have, and uh, you you're won't finished get, with that. I know it's done. So um, it's hard to get an answer, and it's really hard to test these products. Uh, you essentially have to take each one and put it in a vacuum to get any kind of, of, of thought and feeling about, and a lot of it is just going to be plain subjective. Yeah. Uh, uh, still, I think it's something we need to do more of, and, and we will do that. So uh, keep... Keep listening. We'll have more of that type of stuff and more of that discussion as we move forward on this show. And if you listen to the PC Perspective podcast or, you know, read PC Perspective as well. So uh, email from Bean Man. I'm just going to go with it like that. It says, I'm looking to upgrade my PC's CPU from an AMD Phenom to 955 Black Edition to an AMD Pile Driver FX8350 Black Edition. And I'm a little confused with my options due to my motherboard. I have a Asus M4A77T USB 3 AM3 motherboard upgraded to the latest BIOS to accept all AM3 CPUs. I've been told by a few people that some AM3 motherboards will accept AM3 Plus CPUs. This is where I'm confused. The Asus BIOS updated information page does not include any AM3 Plus processors. However, two to three sites I have visited either sell or review the board, say that it will run any AM3 Plus CPU. was wondering if you could clarify this for me. Now, I don't have this motherboard, and Josh, I don't think you actually have this particular motherboard, right? No. Um, what do you think about this? My, my first guess is it's not going to kill anything, but the chances of it working may be lower than you would expect. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't mess with it. I would get a... I mean, if you really wanted to bulldozer, get an AM3 Plus uh, based board because the power delivery is significantly different from the AM3 to AM3 Plus. Um, mm. You may update the BIOS. There may be some some low-level support for uh, the new FX processors, but you're not going to be able to extract the most performance, the the most overclocking, if that's what you're into. Uh, with this older AM3 style board, just because it comes with a a smaller uh, BIOS ROM and a lot of the optimizations that ASUS and all these other motherboard guys do to get the best performance out of you know each individual processor. I mean, they they only have so much room, and so basically, how it was explained to me was that with these AM3 Plus boards. Yes, it's got support for the older AM3 processors, but you're not going to be able to overclock them as much uh, just because there's not enough space in the BIOS to... It, it's kind of hard to explain. But essentially, when you have a CPU, there's a lot of timings and uh, a lot of settings that you cannot get to, that you cannot change. It is just hard-coded in there, low-level. And... When you have different overclocking profiles, uh, it'll adjust those settings that you can't see or adjust yourself, but it'll do it automatically. If right. you have less space, you are you have less of these profiles, and so it will not as effectively kind of support the a modern CPU with a board like this, or vice versa, having a brand new board and using an older CPU on it. Does that yep. make sense? Did I explain no, it, it that does. clear as mud? Yeah, yeah, that makes that makes sense. Uh, and and I think you can get some AM3 mother AM3 Plus motherboards relatively inexpensively as well. If you're yeah, I mean, worried it's about like the, sixty the bucks side. for about that, you know, for for that level of product that he uh, yeah. that he has now, and I think that would be a decent and wise upgrade. Let's take uh, one more note coming in from Matt. Um, more of an informational piece for all of us as opposed to a question. He says, after doing much research, I discovered that Patrick is indeed correct. Most baby tech is indeed complete junk that is unnecessary. This goes back a couple of weeks into the show. Fellow listeners, don't fall into the trap. Do your research. 
He says, I also discovered something in my quest to get rid of old tech. Best Buy has an excellent recycling program. Who knew? They only take three items per day per household, but uh, you only have. But if you only have a few items, you can easily space out the trips or take a friend along and say you're from two different households. I've been able to easily get rid of a whole lot of my out-of-date stuff this way, so I thought I would pass it along. Just remember, pull or wipe your own hard drives just to be on the safe side. Keep up the great work. I didn't know that. I wonder wonder what Best Buy would say if I just came in every day with like three motherboards from eight years ago. Until uh, eventually... Probably they would, they would just say, hey, it's nice to see you again today, Ryan. Because <laughs> <laughs> what do they care, those individuals at Best Buy? I guess, yeah. I, I just, what, what, do they, what do you do when you recycle old electronics like that? Do they melt it down? Do they just they throw it in a dumpster someplace and then I don't have to get in trouble for it? Like, I don't know. I Surely don't know. Best Buy doesn't do that. There, somebody would get in a lot of trouble if that's that's the kind of stuff that was happening. But if uh, if you have a bunch of stuff and you're like me and you don't want to just throw it away, but you don't know what else to do with it, that might be a good option. Just uh, randomly pop into Best Buy with a handful of things and see if they'll take it from you. And then it's not your problem anymore. And nothing's wrong with that. Yeah. Nothing at all. Uh, so that's going to do it. Oh, never mind. <laughs> Here, take this bag. Thank you. Bye. Uh, yeah. That's going to do it for the show this week. Again, if you have any emails, please send them into us. Twitch at twit.tv. T-W-I-C-H at twit.tv. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. I am at Ryan Shrout. Josh, you are? Josh D. Walrath. Josh D. Walrath. D D is in the letter D is in a middle initial, like, right? Like in heavy D. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, and of course, if you are new to the show and you want to find out ways to subscribe, go to twit.tv slash twitch. And uh, you can find all of our back episodes there, ways to subscribe to the audio version or the video version or to find the live feed. Uh, we do record this on Thursdays at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. So uh, set your dials accordingly everywhere else in the world. So with that, uh, uh, we will be back next week. At least one of us will. It may be me. It may be Josh, for all I know. Apparently, Patrick and I don't like to do the show anymore together. So, uh, you know, hey. You don't get along. Couples are fighting. What are you going to do? Yeah. What are you going to do? Uh, see you next time, guys. I'm Ryan Schraub. I'm Josh Walter. Good night.